Hi, everyone. It's another edition of the Football Apex podcast with my friend here, Elliot. How's it going? So we've been two weeks removed, unfortunately, due to, you know, unforespeaking uh, circumstances. But we're here again to be able to talk about the Champions League action of last week, as well as Syria. You know, they say it's a defensive, boring league, but AC Milan are top of the league. And they're not perfect because they drew 3-3 with Roma. And so as a Roma fan, how did you take that game? Uh, it was an interesting one because um, I actually liked – obviously, there were referee circumstances from that game from both sides. So I don't think it was fair to say one way or the other. But it was, it was a perfect storm, basically, because Lotham basically scores on the first, you know, opportunity of the game. And Kambula missed the ball on that play. And he's the one who ended up scoring that late goal. But um, – then Jekyll comes back immediately, totally out, out man's um, Romagnoli, had her, to, had her back there, it's 1-1. And then it's, I felt like Roma in the first half before the game kind of spinned around in the second half, kind of dominated because when you watch the game during that, during that first half, you slow it down. If you like pause, like, so this is what I did in this game because I was just, it just was very interesting to me. So Milan would be pushing the ball forward and I would pause when they were in the midfield and it would be like, you know, the typical Milan people and Zlatan go up, up forward. But in the buildup of the play, you saw like five or six Roma shirts clogging the lanes. And I think this is – and I thought that was actually a really interesting thing because I thought they got away from it a little bit too much in the second half, which is why they were able uh, – obviously, AC Milan were able to score so quickly. But we paused. It was like a very toot, Pellegrini, Spinazzola. It was like they were – they were the, there were white shirts everywhere where Milan was trying to basically – find certain passes to the, and it was just, it was very difficult. So going into the second half, I actually felt really good about it because they, they had that, that one, and I won't, I won't call it lucky because Zlatan knew exactly what he was doing. He makes the touch. I don't think that's on Maranta either. And I don't really think it's on Kambula either. Kambula just mistimed the ball. And I don't, I don't really think it's his fault, but it was just the circumstances allowed AC Milan and then obviously Jacka hits back. And then in the second half, they score immediately. And I, I thought we just started too slow. And again, and then, but after that happened, then we had the whole thing with, with the midfield kind of dictating how everything else was going. And then obviously the controversy penalty for Roma, the controversy penalty for AC Milan. And then this, it was just like a perfectly scripted game because Latan, who scores twice in this game, and we've seen him, and I'm not going to give him credit for this, but like we've seen him do these like back heel uh, clearance balls like a thousand times. But on the corner at the very end, um, where you know he he does this acrobatic kick, puts it right on in, right in front of Kambula where he just smashes it in back and that to make it three three, and then you know it's just so dramatic. And then at the end you had um, you had Cassie uh, have a really you know really powerful hit on uh, in in front of goal and Morante who's by the way thirty seven years old and I'm convinced he's a top three goalkeeper this season makes this outrageous save and then on the last play of the game. Um, Similar to the Jekyll goal with Romagnoli, but Romagnoli wasn't able to put it uh, past them. And it was just uh, – people are going to talk about the controversy because of it was really bad. Both penalties, first penalty. I don't, I'm a Roman fan. I was confused with why they, we were given a penalty. I was glad we were, but I was confused. And then AC, the AC Milan one, it was just like – I mean, I don't think Chanel who even was – I mean, Mancini and Chanel who didn't even touch each other. And he, it was just sort of the – sort of running forward and, and they, they fell down, but not by any other means. But um, I don't know. It was, it was an incredible game. And I like the fact that Roma came back three separate times. And that shows that this Roman team is actually a lot better than people think they are. And if you watch today, they're way better than we thought we, they were last week. And I actually think that just generally speaking, and, and I think AC Milan are in, the, in first place right now. I don't know how long that's going to last just because – they, the, Rome was the only really tough team they played, and they weren't amazing in that game. They're still good, and I th- still think they make changes with no doubt. But I, I just think that there's certain aspects of that. And the thing, the thing I was going to – what I said earlier was, uh, I think if Roma had Zaniolo and El Sharabi in the team, based on the way it's built right now, this, this that would be a t- potentially a title team. And I know that sounds crazy, but they have outperf- – like, if you look at the team so far this season, other than that's a swallow because they're just – crazy right now but Roma's outperformed where the expectations were because if you look at the Milan game Milan Juventus both games Roma probably could have won both of them and as a Roma fan you know you I felt going into the AC Milan game I felt nervous for the first time playing AC Milan because usually with Roma 
uh, AC Milan, Roma shows up, gets points, and goes home. But it's a much different AC Milan, so it was a little difficult. But I thought, I, I thought it was the best match of the weekend, based on everything, even put the controversy in there um, by far. And it was, it was extraordinary. And you see the positives of both both of these teams, and it was just, it was just terrific. <laughs> Um, I definitely think that both penalties were related. Like, I think the Milan penalty was only given because of what happened agree. to Rome. But I don't I, think I it's – yeah, I don't, don't, I don't mean Rome. But I don't think it's fair to say Rome or – sorry, Milan were screwed. Both teams were screwed. Because yeah. I, think, I think the wrong – and I'm, I, I actually generally get on with AC Milan fans. I thought the way they were speaking was as if they were the only one who were being – Yeah, I, I felt that narrative. It was just like, we were screwed. We were up. You were up. Did you not see – like, look, I think – the first one was horrible, but there was at least some contact. It was a foul on us. But on the second one, I don't think he was touched. Mancini kind of, he like swings his foot up. He doesn't make contact. There's no contact with Chinalu. And the reason Chinalu fell down is because he was at full speed. And then he, when the sort of went like that, then he just fell down. So I, I agree. That was that was called because of what happened to the Roma penalty. But I just don't think it's fair to say that either team was robbed. I think they were both were robbed because if you watch the game, that was the right result. If so, if, yeah. if, if Milan had won the game, it would have been. I'm not saying they they weren't good, but three points would have been been more than than they deserved. If Roma had won the game, they would have been more points than they have deserved. So I think, generally speaking, based on you can say whatever you want about anything, but. It was a very, it was a fair result based on the match was played, and I just think it's unfortunate that it was ruined by the officials. But anyway, that's just my point. I, I think M Milan have a point, but Roma have a point also, and it wasn't, I, it wasn't like one team was robbed versus the other. They both were robbed by a, an official that oh, just didn't know what he was doing on that like, on that night. I genuinely do think that it was a fair result. In my head, it's two two. Like it's not three three. In my head, two two. But either yeah. way, that's that's what we were hoping for. I just had. Like the feeling like what if Zlatan missed or what if Roma missed their penalty? Mm. It would have been horrible for them to try to make up the makeup call and then something goes wrong. Yeah. Luckily, yeah. because of how prolific these players are, everything leveled out in the end. But, yeah. you know, one person that wasn't prolific was AC Milan's goalkeeper, who in the absence of Donnarumma, who looked yeah. very shaky, especially on corners and punching mm -hmm. players. Like remember when De Gea first went to Manchester United, how mm -hmm. he would stay back and he wouldn't attack the ball? Yeah. I feel like that's what AC Milan's goalkeeper is suffering from here. Do you think that they're going to be able to trust on him if Donnarumma keeps, you know, if remains injured. I hate this because he, me and him share the same nationality. So <laughs> uh, he was the remaining keeper. And during during his time at Florentine, I thought he did well. During some of the time in France, he did well. And I have high, I had high hopes for him. It was bad. Without Donnarumma, look, I don't think AC Milan win without with Donnarumma. Like, I don't think the result changes. But I think on that particular goal, that shouldn't have happened. Jekko is in the right place at the right time. He made the right movements. He has like a five-inch advantage over the guy who's guarding him. So he's going to score that regardless. But for him to come out and try to punch it, and he just totally mistimes the ball and follows through, Jekko is basically looking at an empty net. And Roman Yoli is pretty physical, but Jekko was way taller than him. So all he has to do is rise up and convert. And I think – I just think I think that you can blame him for that, but I think you also can. Um, I think it was it was the wrong assignment on that corner. I thought, and and I don't know if it changes Jekyll scoring or not, but I think Kessie, physically speaking and height wise, is is he's got more strength in that aspect. Where if Kessie's on Jekyll instead of Romagnoli, the Jekyll's gonna have more difficulty because of how physical a Kessie tends to be at most times. Um, but again. You, I can't blame that it was the goalkeeper's fault. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't think it's fair to say all three goals were on him. But in that game, Maranta had a significant advantage over the goalkeeping because AC Milan came in the box a lot in that game. I never was worried that they were going to score until, obviously, the, the, the second goal that they scored was laid on a plate. The third one was a penalty. So I don't think Romo were ever that sort of – because you can look at the scoreline and you can think the defenses didn't show up. I thought both defenses play well. I just think there were some mistakes. The, the goalkeeping mistake was a big one, but I'm not sure it was the right move at this age to go get someone like him in that moment. Um, not to throw another Romania that they could have got, but I think Radu, who's sitting on the bench at Inter, or I, I think that's where he is right now, he, uh, he can, for a backup 
And I think Ryder deserves to start somewhere. Um, but as a backup, he would have been a better option. And um, it just it just seemed like they may have made a mistake on this particular signing. Um, but again, Donnarumma is there. That doesn't happen. But I still think the score line is is pretty similar regardless. Hmm. But one goal scorer that you brought up was Zlatan Ibrahimovic, who turned 20, uh, sorry, 39, 39 mm -hmm. this year. He may pay like he's 29, though. Yeah. Now, one thing that I was thinking of is he's never going to win the Champions League because AC Milan are a no. Europa League team. And it's not like AC Milan will give him that Champions League glory. So do you think that's going to hinder from his legacy as a top striker of their generation? Like a top striker, not the top striker. No, because I think I think um, the Champions League is – I think it's ridiculous to think that the Champions League per player has more value than another. So um, for some players, it's important for you to win the Champions League. If you don't win the Champions League, if you're Ronaldo, if you're Messi, if you're players like that, you're going to – there's going to be critics on that. Zlatan is not – he's in an interesting place because he should have won the Champions League, obviously, and it would be nice – He's not in the level of uh, sorry of, of Messi and Ronaldo and some other players of that level, and Zlatan's great, but and he's but in but he's not below where he is. So he's in a level in between where you're a player that level that that needs to win the Champions League versus someone who overall collectively it's not as important because um, Zlatan went to you know all these different teams. If you look at the numbers, most of the time he's getting first or second place in the leagues he plays in. He hasn't had a lot of Champions League success, but he's he's he has the longevity argument for him. He's got the the titles with AC Milan, with Inter, with Juventus. I know the Juventus zones were taken away, but he still was a part of those teams. Then he goes to Paris, and I know it's it's easier, but still, I think based on everything, based on his resume, there's no reason that that should not look. You can look at him and say he's not a top. I don't even know where I put him, but like top 15, top 25 player. I don't think not having a Champions League prevents that from being the argument because there's a lot of players who didn't win the Champions League or didn't have an impact in the Champions League fight that they won um, that are uh, considered of that different ilk. With When you're Messi or Ronaldo, the, the rules change. But, look, I, I think it would have been great if he would have won it, and he's not going to win it. And, and there are people who make that argument. But based on his entire resume, I don't think that it, – it's more like um, – I don't know how to ex explain this. The Champions League is 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 like an an extra. So whatever he does, that would be great. But if he doesn't get it, it's not the end all be all. With for other players, it just the rules with the, the value of the Champions League is different depending on what what level you're at. And Zlatan is the level below Ronaldo and Messi, so I feel like it's less important for him, but also important for. They're always gonna, people are gonna make that argument. People are gonna say he didn't win this, he didn't win that. But overall. I don't think it's necessary for him to win it, if that makes sense. You do. You make a valuable point, and I'll bring it up. It's not like the LeBron versus Michael Jordan case, where it's like championships right. are one of those things that define one player over another. Zlatan could win 10 Champions Leagues. I would yeah. never think he's better than Messi. It doesn't matter, right. Just right. based on what Messi has shown. Um, but the fact that he's never won one, and funny enough, you know the story. He lives. Yeah, he leaves. Certain, he leaves, and then they win the Champions League. He yeah. leaves Barcelona. They win the Champions yeah. League. It's, he, yeah. So it's it's unfortunate, but it's not like he was in unfortunate circumstances or in a bad environment. Right. It just the Barcelona one. I don't know how to slice it because Ibrahimovic is partly at fault. He'll never admit to that, but he's partly at fault for how everything went down. He could have worked with Pep. Pep could have worked with him. They're both somewhat responsible for that happening, but they were both so immature about it. So it, I don't think it's not like Zlatan was the reason, but I think if you want to take, if you want to make him take some blame for something, it's the Barcelona one because he could have figured that out and he didn't have to leave Inter either. Mm -hmm. So you mm -hmm. can say, yes, um, he's at fault for the Barcelona one because of his behavior. And then less, yes, you can say for Inter, he decided to leave. I mean, and then they won. But I don't the, the teams that they had with Pep and with uh, Mourinho were already loaded. So it's, and it's it's not like I don't know how to explain it. It's not like that that it's his fault that the, the, the team got better when he left. And I know you can make a lot of arguments with that with a lot of sports, but at the same time, the teams were loaded. They were gonna win it eventually, I feel. Um, but you know, it is what it is. Again, it doesn't Right. It doesn't deteriorate his resume, but it's just unfortunate. That's all. That's all it really is at this point. 
One thing that does that crosses my mind is how Eto was able to do it back to back and almost mm -hmm. inverse what Ibrahimovic did. You yeah. know, where he went from Barcelona, won the treble, went to Inter, won the treble, whereas Slatan, trophyless, not trophyless, sorry, didn't win the Champions League in those two seasons that he went from Inter yeah, yeah. to Barcelona. Genuine question, because we know yeah. this, we know the magnitude and gravity that, that these players have. Mm -hmm. Who's better, Samuato or Zlatan Ibrahimovic? Okay, I'm going to answer this in a very interesting way, okay? Um, if I could have one, if I could sign one player, if I, I don't know, I'm LAFC or something, and I got a blank check, I'm a director, I'm an owner, whatever you want to say, I would rather sign Eto because I know I can put him into any situation that there is, right? So I can be any team, my, my surrounding pieces can be anybody, and he'll bring me success, but I think overall Zlatan is a better player, but I would rather sign Eto. And I would, I would even argue prime Barcelona Eto is probably better than Zlatan, uh, Zlatan in general. But I would say that Zlatan's entire career and his abilities, I think he's a better player, but I would rather sign Eto because of the maturity. And, and it's not that Zlatan doesn't have the maturity. And I love his quotes. I love like lines don't compare that some themselves to humans. I've used similar quotes to describe certain things as well, but it's it, sometimes it's just a bad look. It's just, he's, he always talks about how confident he is, but there is arrogance to that in the way he's, he says things and things like that. And I love Zlatan is, is just, he's a gift from God really because of all the stuff that, that we, that we get from him, not, not just from the football pitch, but from the media side, from, you know, him him standing when a referee's trying to give him a yellow card and making him come to him, stuff like that. So there's so much things to love about Zlatan, but I, if I'm at team that I'm going for the Champions League and trying to win something and I need I need I need character pieces in my my team who's not gonna make noise in the media, who's not gonna have his agents calling the club and, and complaining about wages or what he he drives to the training ground drown as the a famous Barcelona story. Um, I'd rather sign Eto, but I think Zlatan is probably better, if that makes sense. It does, it does. Because like I look at his skill set and I never question what Barcelona wanted out of Ibrahimovic. It's yeah. just whether or not it would work. Like he's a six foot five striker who can handle the ball. Like yeah. he can dribble pretty well for his height. Um, can win headers. At the time he had a bit of pace on him. He was generally the best yeah, was he, he was the best available striker at the time? Do you think so? Uh, what year would that oh, have been? 2009. It could have been Wayne Rooney or Ibrahimovic. Was Suarez at Liverpool at the time? Oh, no. Suarez was still at Ajax and hadn't truly become like a, a master number nine. Yet. I think at the time it was just Tevez, Zlatan, Eto, and Rudy. Ramadja didn't have an elite striker. Higuain was not an elite striker at the time. And he'd gone from I where, where was he before that? Inter or? Uh, or... Suarez was at Ajax and he went to Liverpool. But in what about Zlatan? Was, where was Zlatan before? He was, not a he was just a prospect. No, I got that. Oh, he was at Inter Milan. Yeah. Yeah, he probably was the best available striker because, well, first of all, Rooney was never going to be an option for them anyways. No, no. Um, and I but thought like Rooney was highly regarded, but he wasn't – I, I just think that Barcelona didn't want to go that route for, I don't, I don't need to get into why, but I, I think that's, they, so they went for, yeah. I mean, I mean, in hindsight, Tevez probably would have been the better fit for what Pep was trying to do, but it's a tough one because he's, he has all the qualities for Pep's football, but he, he was, he was undisciplined in Pep's um, de demands of how he wanted to play football. Does that make sense? There's quote, yeah, there's a quote from Thierry Henry where Thierry Henry scores a goal, but because he was at striker, removed from the left wing that Pep wanted, yeah. he slows him off. Right. Um, right. Pep have you have you seen the um uh, the documentary uh, pass the ball, uh, take the ball, pass the ball, the Pep documentary at all? Oh, I if haven't. Have, but I should if you have it, really, it's really good. Uh, it's on Netflix. But um, I'll so there's this there's this moment where um they're talking about a player who. I don't think was there that long. He was kind of, he kind of flamed out. Um, and they talked about um, how skillful he was. And then it was either, I think Xavi or Iniesta was talking. I'm not sure which one. And they talked about how the fact that he, he, you know, he, 
Pep has a very specific thing he wants to do in each situation, right? And instead of going through that, he had a good cross on him. So he, had, he probably clipped in a, a cross inside to Ibrahimovic, who, who almost scored. But he was taken out at halftime, not because of that he wasn't playing well, but because he made that decision. He went against Pep's football. Um, it was Jerry Henry? It wasn't Henry. It was, it was somebody else. If I said his name, I don't think you would have known. It, it was someone what? who was like from Turkey or one of those. It was, it was a very short – this guy was at Barcelona for like a year. He played wow. like maybe 14 games or something like that. But he was like one of these young Barca talents that they tried that, and it, it's kind of just flamed out. Um, he's a very, I, it was a very difficult name to pronounce. But I just remember them talking about the fact that he was taken off. It wasn't because, you know, he, he didn't have a good first half. I don't, I don't remember what game it was, so I can't say for sure. But because he made that pass to Ibrahimovic instead of passing to, I think it was Xavi or Iniesta, who was because they were doing the, the tiki taka style short passing, and the next sequence was to like Javier Iniesta. And instead, he saw Zlatan open up near the goal and he hit across to him and, and almost scores. Uh, but he was taken out because of that just that stink decision. So, m- my point here is, and the reason I'm bringing this is Zlatan, I think, was not disciplined and went against the way Pep plays. So, a lot of times he'll be in similar situations and he would think. I wouldn't say selfishly, but think for himself in those moments what he thinks the best thing to go. So he goes against Pep's football, which tarnished the relationship between them that was already kind of icy and stuff like that. So that's just the way I see it. But again, Henri is another great example of of that scoring a goal. But because he he went against the philosophy, he got benched. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I'm looking back at the Barcelona 2009-2010 expenditure. They only netted 2 million euro, and they spent 83.5 million that summer to bring in Ibrahimovic and Maxwell, as well as, you know, a few other players. But yeah, they invested so much into him. And what did they end up recouping? Didn't they sell him to AC Milan for 20 million? It was, it was a low price. I know that he scored 20-something goals that season. He might have even been their top scorer at that point. Um, but because of, like I said, because of the, the way Pep and, and him treated each other, it was just a bad situation. And then there was, if you read, if you, his, in his book, he talks about certain things. And in the book, there's, there's situations where, um, um, they were going to sign, um, uh, either David Silva or David Villa and, um, Slatan's camp was saying that if he brings him in to for his, to compete for his position, he'll leave. But if he comes to sit on the bench, then he'll stay. So stuff like that. Yeah. So this this is a story I don't know that I may know about. They were after one of those two, and basically, no, it wouldn't have been it would have been job Silva because he plays a different position. But David Villa, who was who was at um, he was at Valencia. Valencia, Valencia at the time, right? And they were going to yeah. sign him potentially, and. Zlatan was, he was, he was not, he, he basically was saying, I'm, I'm gone if you're going to try to bring in this guy to, to challenge me, to replace me, or whatever you want to say. Um, instead, he, it, so he's creating talk. He calls Pep the philosopher. They didn't speak that much. Pep's, Pep's at blame too. But the way Ibrahimovic handled it from his personal situation and the, his agents and the things they were leaking at the time. Um, so this, this, this report came from his agent rather than from Ibrahimovic himself. But that's, I mean, it's, it's a Barcelona meeting. That's just, that's just creating more poison inside that situation. So, I mean, we could do a whole thing on what happened between him and him and uh, Pep, but it, I just feel like it was a poisonous relationship from the start. Pep, Pep might've started it because of the, the thing he said about um, the types of cars that Ibrahimovic was driving. Yeah, Ferrari, yeah. I, I think that was a bad thing for him to say to him. I think that was a bad look. Just because that starts, I mean, that starts the unraveling of the situation immediately. I mean, if he comes, if he comes prepared, if he plays hard, if he works hard, if he, he if he listens to the manager and delivers, then he can be driving whatever he wants. That, that's just my viewpoint. Um, and then, so that was a bad start to the situation. But then it kind of escalated because of all the other stuff that was happening. And then his agent is leaking things out of, of I'd love to go play for this team, this team, this team. After there was rumors about them getting uh, David uh, Villa and they eventually signed him, but 
he was okay. He was only okay with them signing him if it wasn't to challenge his spot. And they were going to replace Ibrahimovic in the lineup. It was just, I think, another piece that could help Barcelona push even further. Sort of like, I think it's not a great example because um, these players aren't at that level. But they, uh, so Jacko is is older in age, and they brought in uh, uh, Morial to come push push Jacko to be better. Not necessarily taking his position, but same kind of logic. They were going to bring in Villa with Zlatan to push Zlatan to be better, but also Villa would have his opportunities to, to show what he can do. And Zlatan was not okay with that. So it's hard to say. Uh, Ibrahim was just great. There's a lot of things you, you love about him. But the, the, there's certain mistakes he's made just from a character standpoint that prevented him from, from being in that conversation. Because he is good enough to be in the GOAT conversation, but he's not in it. And I think the big reason why he's not in it is because of some of the scenarios that sort of escalated. And we all love Zlatan. We love his humor. We love his personality. And his longevity is unbelievable. There's a real question right now if Ronaldo or Zlatan is better at this point in time. And I don't really have an answer to that. But so there's a lot of great things that we have about Zlatan. But his those sort of situations, I think, prevented him from being in that next tier of, of greatness, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. It does. Do you think that he saw success way too late in his career? Or do you think that helped? Because there's like a recency bias. And what I mean by that is like, if Zlatan had seen success in his 20s, the way he saw in his 30s, yeah, then maybe he wouldn't have had that drive. But because he was so unsuccessful in his early career, he must have had those remnants of like, wow, I didn't really win that many trophies, or I never won the Champions League. And it pushed him to be like a lethal player for, for PSG, for you know, AC Milan, First stint and second stint. Yeah, Juventus. Um, yeah. Little Man United, little more AC Milan, and yeah, um, I completely his, forgot about Manchester. Uh, Ajax, Ajax, and not not his second, not his first season, but his second season at Malmo was pretty fantastic. Um, that mm -hmm. earned him that move to AC Milan. So to answer your question, I think. So obviously we we know the story that he almost quit football because there was a lot of stuff going on and all that stuff, and he decided to play football. Um, and then he had this bravado, this, this, which we love, his arrogance that he's, he's this. And, but um, I just think, so I thought he went into his first team, his first real team, thinking he was better than everybody else. Not, not feeling that he needs to prove that he's better than everyone else. So I think that small aspect of that situation could be a big reason why he didn't reach, he didn't feel the motivation to push where you have guys, uh, Ronaldo, for example, um, with, with all the stuff that went on, having to move away from his home in, um, in Portugal to go to Sporting, or not, um, um, where, where is he from? Uh, oh, no, no, before, I'm talking before that. Um, Andorria. Yeah, 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 that's right. I just didn't remember the name of the, the, the place he was from. So he goes there to Lisbon to play for Sporting, where he felt that motivation, that push, that push, that push. Then he plays Man United, and he, he takes that platform to show what he can do. And he's pushing, he's pushing, he's pushing. And then he goes to Man United, he's talented. But all these all these seasoned veterans are telling him that, he, you know, uh, just be more on self, be more this. And uh, you don't always have to do it by yourself. And then they talked about him, like, never using his head. And then he learned the, the ability to do that and that and that. And then he goes to Real Madrid, and he, he doesn't win much. I mean, if we're going to be honest here, outside of the European success, he doesn't, he do, he doesn't win anything. And I actually think, looking back now, if he had stayed instead of left to go to Juventus, and I think it was a great move for everyone that he went to Juve. But the way the La Liga is right now, he could have won a couple more in the next couple of years. But that's a whole nother point. But the fact is, he, he just had to push himself to his level. And he wasn't – he was talented. But he wasn't, like, at seven years old, the best seven-year-old of all time. You know what I mean? So he had to work on those things. He, he, he takes tremendously – um, good care of his body. I actually, I think he's um, the football equivalent, LeBron James, a little bit. Yes, absolutely. From he spent a million physical, dollars. Yes, from a physical standpoint. And look, I think, I think it's foolish to say there's not been any deterioration. But what deterioration means for Ronaldo is he goes from a top two player to a top fifteen player, not like a top fifteen player to not relevant. So I, you know, I still think it's fantastic. He's obviously not the level he once was, but still, the fact that he's that good, that it's not like a huge drop-off, like he's falling up a cliff. 
It's like he fell off a bicycle and then got back up, but a few other people got on their bicycles before he got on. I don't know if that's the best way to put it, but you know, so you, you look at all this stuff and, but with, with Ronaldo at, at, he was individually, I don't know if there was a better stretch of time. And I'm not talking about Messi at Barcelona because that's unfair, but in yeah. the span of time he was there and what he put together statistically and all that other stuff in the Champions League and in the league, even though he only won two titles uh, with, with three on Madrid, um, it's still tremendous because of what, what he's done. But um, he, he, but again, he's been booed at the Bernabeu, which I think is utterly ridiculous. Crazy. But it's crazy. But um, but he's always found a way in those situations to push himself that extra mile. What I feel like Zlatan at times, and this this I mean this is when he was still old, but when he was at, <laughs> when he was with the Galaxy, and things weren't going his way, he. I don't know. I wouldn't say he gave up, but there were certain aspects of him showing an unreal amount of frustration. Um, and I mean, he walked into that as the best player in the league. But yes, still there was. And another, actually, another what um, example is Henri. When Henri went to our, I'm um, sorry, the Red Bulls, um, he would do these things where he would he would try to beat everyone by himself, and then when. When he when he lost the ball, he put his hands up as if someone else was supposed to help him out. Um, so that just that sort of mentality, I think, is a little similar in that aspect. If, if that makes sense, it does. Um, speaking of Henri, like that's a, that's a brand new thing that rekindled in my head. He never won the ball in door, and do you think he was robbed in two thousand four by Andrei Shevchenko? Um, yeah, in two thousand four. Um, that was that was a crazy year, by the way. Porto yeah. won the champ, Greece won the Euro, and Henri won the Invincibles trophy, Premier League title. Okay, so won the ball. Uh, Shevchenko. Okay, so which which? Year, sorry, just I just want, I'm gonna go into this in a second. But what's what's what year? Nedved. Nedved was 2007, right? Nedved, I believe, was 2003, because. Juventus made the Champions League final after eliminating Real Madrid. So which year are you talking about then? Uh, well, I'm talking about 2004. 2003-2004, that season. Where Henri was top scorer. He had 20 goals, 20 assists. Won the league undefeated. Um, and, you know... Was okay. Oh, I got you. Um, Jesus. Um, probably. Um, probably. I mean, based on... I love Shevchenko. He he won nothing with AC Milan, and that's one of these things. And I love the guy. Um, I'm, I wish him well with the with the, the Ukrainian national team. I actually think he's doing a really good job there. Um, but probably. Um, so here's the, the what people tend to say is Neved was it on rear. I disagree with that. That was a Toti year, 100 percent. Or not? No, sorry, not not Toti. So okay, let me let me let me rephrase this. So in mm. Henri should have won in 2004. Yeah, Toti, I think so. this is my opinion. You can take my Roma bias or whatever. Toti should have won in 2001 and 2007. So 2001 was a year, the year. Michael Owen. The, Michael Owen did, and, and Toti had won the league for the first time. He had 12 goals in the league, but or something like that. But it's just all the other stuff he did. And in the second half of that year, he was that was his, I think his best statistical um, campaign. So I think if, if we're just talking general robberies, it was Neved. It was the Neved one that Toti should have won. It was. Shevchenko won that um, 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 that Henri should have won. And then I, I felt that Michael Owen won was also a, a total one. And I'm, I'm trying to be as unbiased about that. I, I genuinely believe with my Roma biased apart that those two belong to Toti and that one belonged to Nevet, or not Nevet, um, Henri, without question, based on the season he had, based on the 20 goals, based on the assists, based on everything he achieved. And there's, there's even... Kaka was great in 07, and I love Kaka, and he deserves to have a Ballon d'Or in his trophy case. That one's also up for debate as well, I think. Mm -hmm. Especially I think, with I think there's others you could have put in that situation. I'm fine with, with, with Kaka. I, I have issue with Nevid and Shevchenko and Owen. Those are the three I have a real issue with. Um, I have a slight issue with Modric in uh, 2018, but, again, that have, one – go ahead. I have a conspiracy about the Modric. Which one? And also, just just to clarify, 2001 hurts everyone in Spain forever because Raul could yeah. and should have won it, mm -hmm. or at least been in contention for it. Yeah, it went to Michael Owen, who didn't win the league, won 
practically nothing and it was just the english media like yeah that got him that like attention if, to if, to if you lined up every metric toti won in every metric and he won the league and it was the first title since 1984 um and then raul obviously is in there too. it's hard because it's i i just feel that Toti should have won one, and I think that's utterly ridiculous that he didn't. And I, I think Henri should have won one, and I think it's utterly, and Raul should have won one at some point as well. So we can go back and forth about all the ones that they messed up. I don't mind Modric getting it mostly because, I mean, for me, it's just, it's more, it's, it's, it's less about whether he deserved it. I thought he's a player that, de- that was deserving of it. Um, if you look at, he was a child of war, much like Jekyll was back in the day. Um, in the same area period because of the, the war between um, a Croatia, Serbia, Montenegro, all, all these other, all these countries. He, he goes above that. He goes to Spurs. They don't think he's very good. He goes to Real Madrid. He's voted their worst ever signing. <laughs> then he, 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 there's a stretch of time where he's just the, the greatest thing going um, in that world cup. He played, uh, I mean, miles, miles and miles of games. Um, and is a big part of them getting to that, that stage. Um, so I don't mind him getting it. Messi should have won that one. Or you can even say Ronaldo. It depends where you want to go with that one. But I don't have an issue with that one because I thought based on – he deserved it. So he, here's what I'll say. Neved, Neved, um, Shevchenko uh, – this is going to be hard for me to say but um, because I love Shevchenko. Shevchenko and Michael Owen and Neved, the, they didn't deserve it. It wasn't like they were – there was other people who were more deserving – I didn't think those three deserved to, to win it, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? Because you can say for Modric, yeah, he didn't deserve it, but he was deserving of winning it. Where For the other three, I don't see it the same way because I felt each of those years, um, you could have gone Toti, Henri, and then there's probably someone else you could put in there um, that, that, that that's meaningful. Plus, <laughs> won, won Serie A like, only once. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that's, that's more than a lot of people, but – that was an AC Milan team that was loaded and should have done better. So, and I, I'm not putting that on him, but based on that situation, those three, I think are just up for debate. And I'm sure there's other ones that we're not even thinking of, but those are the three in my mind where I said the most controversial sort of uh, Ballon d'Or choices, I think were those three. It was, it was, it was Nevid, Michael Owen, and um, um, uh, Shevchenko. Mm-hmm. We've, I think Lionel Messi is obviously the best player of all time. I have to yeah. mention it. It's like it's almost a routine. Like wake up, talk about Messi. Yeah. Go to yeah. I genuinely think 2009 could have been Xavi's Ballon d'Or, or could have been up for debate, or Xavi or Iniesta. Iniesta. Yeah, I would say, I, that year I would say Iniesta if it's not Messi. Yeah. Personally. You think at the time we didn't know Messi would win four in a row, but yeah. looking back at it, do you think that they should have like? pitifully given the 2012 one to Iniesta or, or done something knowing well that they deserve some sort of recognition or would it have been unfair? Cause 2012 was the Messi's No, 21, 2012, they, they should give it to Messi. If Messi doesn't exist, it's Iniesta's. Shall we, you can put it in there too. I personally thought that year Iniesta was a little better, but I mean, it's, it's, they're like millicules better. You know what I mean? Cause they were, they were, they were so good. Um, they're telepathic. I think, but, but that year unleashed, um, I don't know how to how to phrase this. It changed the rules of the of the Ballon d'Or, and that's what it. That's the one thing I hate about it now. It's it's who has the most goals? Do they win the Champions League? Um, so I think that year, the, the the way they looked at the Ballon d'Or completely changed, and that was a consequence of the next ten years. And yes, Ronaldo in those in then that decade, it should have been Messi, Ronaldo, Ronaldo, Messi, Messi, Ronaldo, Ronaldo, Messi. I get that. But now that that okay, I, I wouldn't say neither one of those guys are at the level that they that they are at. They're not at the level that they were. So there's some. It's it's heartbreaking, but there's some deterioration with Ronaldo, and you're starting to see a little bit with Messi. Yes. Um, no goal from open play this year. I hate to say yeah. it. Um, it hurts. <laughs> I didn't want to say this, but it's it's. You know, it's funny. At that I started point, praising it's true. him a lot. I started praising him a lot, and I generally thought he looked really washed in El Clasico. I couldn't I couldn't believe it. Yeah, because he looked great in the Champions League, but then when I watched El Clasico and even some other, even the game that they just had, so he's still the best player in the world just because there's not a strong enough case for somebody else. But yes, if, if Messi, if Messi doesn't get back in gear, I mean, we're, as hard as it is, we're starting to see a deterioration in both of them. 
so it's going to be the passing of the torch before we know it. Um, and, you know, it's, it's unfortunate, but that's just the reality. So with all that going on, I think the rules of the Ballon d'Or will, will, will go back to it. And we, we need, I mean, I think at some point we need to have the conversation of what, what should be the qualifications for it. Because this is the thing I've always struggled with. It can't just be I had the most goals, I won the Champions League. That's, 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 that's an egregious way to look at it. Because if that's the – but it's, it's not just that. It's, that's the, the rule for the top two. The rest, it's not the same logic. Because um, I, I mentioned him again because that's how much I love Ed and Jekko. But the year he had 39, based on the season he had, despite, it, despite winning nothing, the year he had 39, he deserved to be in the top five. And he got, I think, 29th or something. <laughs> <He> was, <laughs> up to 30, he was 29th. And, and, um, I remember Dries Mertens was, was 30. But it, it, so they, they have to decide what the Ballon d'Or is. Obviously, the best player in the, it can't just be who are the best player in the world. Who had the best year, and what the other deteriorations of it, of sort of how you're going to define what it means? Because at this point, I'm not even sure what it means. I think Lemadowski should get this year if he keeps yep. up his form, um, but it shouldn't just be I scored the most goals. You should be able to win the Ballon d'Or and have four goals. That should be back, like because back in the day, that's used the way it used to be, and now I think they lost. There's just so much lost, and I think there needs to be. They should come out with, and, and they can make the decision, but they have, they should, they should have, FIFA should, uh, I don't know, put out a statement about what the qualifications for the Ballon d'Or are and what their, what their validation of it is. Not that, that we have to vote or anything like that. They get to vote, but they should explain to us what, you know, what's, what is the most important aspects of a season. Because you can say some years there, there's players who have 35 goals and 15 assists, but they don't win anything they get, they get punished. So, I mean, look, in my heart of hearts, I kind of think Mo Salah should have won the year Mojo Kwan. Me too. I thought Messi won something, so I put him a little bit ahead of him. So at the time I had said Messi, looking back, I would probably give it to Mo Salah. Yeah. Uh, because you look at the seasons before that too, and because and, it, it takes – from the, that you know, from that January to that January, so that that's part of the Roma, the, the last uh, couple months of Roma too. So I don't know. So I'm I'm okay with giving it to someone who didn't win anything. I'm really fine with that. If if it's so overriding than of everyone else, you know what I mean? It's just I, I just don't like where the Ballon d'Or is, and I feel like there should be some explanation of what the idea of what the a winner needs to be able to do. You know what I mean? Speaking of that, that means, what do you think of the 2013 Ballon d'Or awarded to Cristiano Ronaldo over Frank Ribery, who won the treble with Bayern Munich? Do you think that was rightful? Um, um, I, I, I see both ways. Obviously, Ribery was outstanding, and they won the they won the treble. Um, but man, Ronaldo was like unconscious that year. He, I, oh, I, 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 as much as I love Ribery, I. I and I know a lot of people talk about the Schneider Messi one and the Ribery Ronaldo. I still think I'd give it to, to Ronaldo. He was on, I think he had 60 something goals that year. 69. He was fueled by the Messi 91 goals. He was on fire and Messi yeah. was suffering injuries, but he was going hard at it. And Ronaldo himself had injuries, but yeah. he scored 69 goals, which I believe is like maybe 10th all time for a calendar year. Yeah, it's crazy. Ronaldo can consistently score you a lot of goals, but he never had that haul that Messi had of ninety-one. Yeah, yeah. I, I say um, I, I say this all the time. Um, Ronaldo is the most gifted. Okay, let me let me preface this. Ronaldo is the most gifted goal scorer I've ever seen in my life. I easy. think Pushkas is the the best goal scorer. Um, I always got to mention mention him because he's important to the history of the game. But but Ronaldo's just gift for scoring, and I see he's even more gifted in the scoring way the Messi because people I don't look at Messi as a goal scorer I don't think of that when I think of Messi I think of dribbling I think of creating, of yeah. all this other creating stuff when I think of Ronaldo I think of a strike from outside his aerial code you know what I mean like yeah. one of these from like just way out there like most the most strikers or players wouldn't even even think about trying to strike in that way so it's just like that year he was unconscious and I don't use that word very much just be, that's just how good he was so I don't think it's fair to take that away from from him and give it to to Ribery. Um, there's been mistakes in the Ballon d'Or voting for a long time. I thought that one was right, and I I still stand by it. I don't think Schneider should have got it either. 
because Schneider was important for Inter Milan, but Messi was the still best had a, the world. Messi still had a different level of that that season. So it's just like, and I mean, even the statistics were just so like this. And I don't think that's the only thing that matters. I I do think that, man. The thing is, at the time, like. It, on face value, you know, PK once said Messi should have won every single ball in door since 2009. Yeah. Which you could make the case. <laughs> but but you got, we got to look at this this way. He's Messi's teammate. You know yeah, what I mean? That's the, that's if Messi thing. was my teammate, I'd probably say the same thing. That's why <laughs> I see the most value is people who haven't played with any of these guys. So yeah. when, I guess, someone like Dybala is oh, yeah, oh, and okay. is saying something nice about Lukaku or something. I feel like that's genuine, or I don't know if you ever said that, but you know, that, that's what I mean. So someone mutual that doesn't have a, like, yeah, Alex Ferguson is another one, but it's, it's just him. And, you know, Schneider was great that year, but I can point to some other years that were better than Schneider's year. So I think Schneider, that was the best year of his career. But of those types of seasons, I don't think that was the best of those types of seasons. The only difference is they won the treble. Because you can, you can easily say that, um, like, Papu Gomez – not last year, but the year before that, had a better season than Schneider did the year that they won the treble. But they won nothing, so it wasn't in the same, you know, conversation. And so Schneider was great, and based on the season he had, he deserved it. But, again, it's just like the quality between him and Messi were still – it was so ginormous that you can't do that even if Champions League. And I think that this – the idea that you have to give it to someone who won the Champions League is ridiculous. I, if, if you win nothing and you're still the best player by far, then you should give it to you. If – you were unconscious and you won nothing. And then someone else who was similarly won something, then you give it to the person with the trophy. But I don't know. The, the ball and door is just so top. It's, it's almost like toxic at this point because they yeah. don't, they don't really understand. And it's not like we have a say, but if there was a statement saying what we look for in the ball and door, then we could understand where they're coming from. So when you have, you know, Griezmann m- making third in, in the ball and door the year, France won the World Cup when they were like four or five players better than him you know, from January to January. Just give and us some explanation. That's all I'm asking for. Speaking of Griezmann, you bring up a great point because 2016 for me is so funny. Cristiano Ronaldo could have won the Ballon d'Or any other season but that one. But the fact that he won trophies, it was given to him. Yeah. Because in 2016, you had Luis Suarez, top scorer of La Liga. Griezmann. Was, th- was that the year he hit 59 goals? I believe so. No competition. Yeah, that was – how did he not get it? And, and here's, here's my theory. So I, I, th- I talked about this in another situation. I think it's because people don't like him. Yeah. Because um, I don't know if you saw this game, but a few uh, like a week ago, um, Federico Chiesa for Juventus got this foul that was a, probably a yellow card, but he was given a red. And people were, were arguing about him, talking about how this happened. And my answer was the same. People don't like him. So if Federico Chiesa does something, a, a dirty play, and let's say uh, Jordan Veratut does a similar dirty play, Jordan will get a yellow, Chiesa will get a red because people don't like Chiesa. He's unlikable. Where Jordan doesn't have a dirty thing in his body, so we'll give him the benefit of the doubt. So similar si- situation in this. Suarez, at that time, his reputation was being a um, – I'm not going to get into the P- Patrice Ever situation, um, but – Nuisance. He was unlikable, and he was someone who was famous for biting people. So it, you don't want to give it. You don't want him to win. You know what I mean? So I felt like they made a decision not to give it to him because of, you know, because of basically and, and reputation. Just because they don't like him. You've ever heard the phrase "reputations are earned, not given." Right. Suarez bit three people: one in a World Cup, one in the league, and, and one in, and in the other one, Dutch league. Dutch league, yeah. Um, go ahead. Not to mention, he, but he delivered. He, if you told me Luis Suarez was the best player that year, or 2014. He was. So he, he, he was, it was the year he had 59. I don't know what year that was. That was his, that was, he was the best player that season. And that's the yeah. thing you have to focus on. It's not, Messi's a better player, but that season, nobody was even close to him. Exactly. 59 goals, 24 assists. And they won. They won the league. They won the Copa del Rey, and then they won the um, Copa. They got, else. yeah, the Super Copa. But they got eliminated from the Champions League by Atletico Madrid, by Griezmann, who was yeah. very, 
determining in that. Oh, Griezmann, yeah, I, that, I, I get that one. But I, I think the Suarez, the 59 goal one was um, Messi's fifth one, where it was him, um, it was him. Uh, oh, that was the treble MSN season, 2014-15. Was it? Where they won the championship. No, 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 I think it was the year after. Because it was, it, oh, was, yeah. it, was, it was Neymar, it was Messi. No, he, because he wasn't even candidate that year. He got the 59. It was Neymar, Messi, and, and uh, 2015. It must have been 2015. Oh, that was Messi, Ronaldo, and Neymar. Yeah, so he wasn't even involved. But, but that's the year he had 59 and 24. I remember it was the year after they'd won the, won the, um, won the Champions League. It was the next year where they, I think they had uh, they'd gone out to uh, – uh, not Juventus. Um, it was but, uh, Atletico Madrid. Yes, the second time. Sorry, because they got knocked him out twice. Because remember, a few yeah. years ago, they lost, beat him to the La Liga title. I just got confused. The year that Atletico knocked him out, that was that was Luis Suarez, 59 goals, 24 assists. And I, I he took like seven penalties. So it wasn't like 15 penalties minimized. So for me, just personally, I think when you're looking at the golden boot, you should subtract penalties just to see the value of, of what they did. So even then, even if you took away every penalty you took that season – he still was. He still scored more goals than everybody else by far. So if he has 59 goals, he had I don't know whatever penalties. Let's say he had nine penalties. It drops him down to 50. He still scored 50, still 50 goals, goals. <laughs> without penalties. And you can say penalties. Everyone looks at it a different way. Some say it's 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 not a, a goal. I think it counts as goals. But I think when you're counting, when you're looking at the golden uh, shoe or whatever, they should take him out just to see how many goals in open play they scored. 50 goals from open play or whatever it was, 47 goals from open play is still absolutely ridiculous. And at the time, I'm not a big fan of Luis Suarez because most of us weren't. But that year, you can't, you can't argue against – and even if Messi got it and he deserves his six, I can't – there's not a real argument to say that he didn't – that Suarez didn't deserve it. That's, that's, that's counted for like almost 70 goals, just one person. And that's not counting the amount of assist assist he put to Messi and Neymar. So it's just it's 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 crazy. And also, like this one final point, but it was something that I was thinking about making. Yeah. Anton Griezmann, 2016. Honestly, man, every kid wanted to be like him. Yeah. Cristiano Ronaldo, obviously number one. Everyone gets the hairstyle. I thought at that time he, I thought he was the best. I thought he was the third best player in the world. Honestly, at that time. <laughs> yeah, like who didn't want him? Manchester United, why on earth did they not trigger his 100 million? I'll never know. I will never know. Yeah. Because they could have easily afforded Pogba and. And they and they that, were not. Yeah, that was the idea, though, wasn't it? It was it was like was bringing Pogba and him. I would have signed him instead, honestly. <laughs> Pogba wanted to go, but he would have been okay if he just stayed where he was. Yeah. Um, plus they could have they would have enough money to buy him. Yeah. See, they screwed up. They should have they they should have signed Griezmann that summer. And then the next year, Pogba should have stayed for one more year, and then they could get Pogba the next year. So they would have Griezmann and Pogba and then the rest. And, uh, you know, stuff like that just changes everything. But who knows what the rest of the team would look like. But, yeah, Griezmann was unbelievable that year. And it's it's so weird seeing him not at that level anymore. It's just like he it just showed up and left in a year. <laughs> it's like, I – I recognize good football and good football players. It doesn't yeah. matter who they play for. Like when he was at Atletico Madrid, wow, how much, how I wish he was in a Real Madrid jersey. Or when David Villa, my favorite player ever, yeah. scored against Manchester United in the Champions League final. Yeah. Only time I celebrated a Barcelona goal because it was David yeah. Villa, my yeah. favorite player. I, so, the funny thing is, and I mean, I, Roma weren't in a position to win the league at the time, but. I wanted them to – I didn't think so. That was, I think that was the record-breaking year or maybe the year after. Um, I wanted Napoli to sign him because I felt Napoli had everything going for them. And this was before Higuain went to Juventus. I thought they should have gone out – it might have been afterwards. I'm not sure. Um, I thought they should have gone after Griezmann because if you put Griezmann in that – and sorry, he's Napoli. Oh, my God. <laughs> Martins. Would have been – Insigne, too. Insigne, Martins. Great. And then you, you still had Hamshik in the midfield. Um, I'm not sure if Fabian Ruiz arrived yet, but they still had Calajon. And I, it was just a crazy team already. Hmm. Wow. But 2017 Napoli, do you think that's the prime? Like, obviously, ignore Maradona's time. You think in the last 10 years that that's that, the no, Okay, so, so 86 is the best, most successful team that, that, of Napoli. That that the year, and I, I'm getting my years off of my stuff, but that the Sarri's football, the year that they went 
Um, not the second time, the first time, where they pushed, with the thirty six goals from McQueen in the league. Yeah, that one. That Napoli yeah. is probably the best Napoli that there ever has been. And I'm not saying that that they didn't win the title, but that team was better than the one that Diego Maradona won the league with. And that's just me. Um, it just was perfect. And I mean, they were loaded everywhere. Um, they. They, 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 they cracked on the pressure. They couldn't deliver at the end. And that's when I started to, to question whether Sarri was the right manager for that job. Um, but in fairness, they haven't looked as good since. And I don't think Sarri is unbelievable. I'd like to see him back coaching soon. I think Fiorentina is a spot for him once. Um, Cause I, I don't know why they still hang on, hanging on with that guy. Um, Cause it just seems like he doesn't have any clue what, he, what he's doing with the, with the team of talent he has. Because it's, 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 this, it's this old story. Every, every year, Florentina fans or other fans are saying, oh, they're going to push for the top half of the table. Gonna, they might have a Europa League spot. And, I, and I, every year I say the same. I'll believe it when I see it. And then, you know, they, they, they have a great performance against Udinese and Spezia. And then, and then they play a real team. And, and today's game against Roma, Roma was in control, like, the entire game. It was one of those games where Fiorentina will come – come into the box and I'm just sitting back like no they're not gonna nothing's gonna happen here just because they they, they were suffocated practically the entire match and and it's 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 so conflicting because they have so many talented players even after Chiesa left they have Castrovilli who's just a oh, wonderful player they have Vladovic who so has so much potential they have Kalajan who who was great for an Abbey for all those years and they have all these really outstanding players they have uh, Milinkovic in the defense and and it's just like every year they tell me they're going to be great and they haven't been. But um, anyway, so I, I'm, I just think Sarri's Napoli was just um, – it was just something else. And I think just – Historically, they had historically the, speaking, I've always liked Fiorentina, though. They had Mauro Bresson, yeah. Luca Toni, and um, I don't know who else – Best Duta. Historically. Best yeah. Duta. Um, <laughs> but, no, I, I've always loved Florentina, too. And, and I don't take any pleasure – uh, I put out a tweet today saying they're they're an average team with talented players, but um, got a few people riled up. But um, my 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 big point with them is I want them to be good, but it's it's the management is the problem and the coach is the problem. Get a better coach, and I'm I I, I like Camicio as a personality. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's he's and he's the one like feeding this. Like we're gonna be this amazing team, and then. It's, you know, they, they're going to end up in like a – I don't think they're good. They'll probably finish like 10th, 11th, 12th, somewhere around there. But the first time they played against a real team, that that team had the best performance of their entire season. So there's something not clicking here. And I, I, I've always loved Florentina. I love Bastuja, not just because he was Roma. All the years he was at uh, Fiorentina, and he stayed with them when they went down and got relegated, got them back up and all those stuff. But uh, – I don't know. They're just in a, in a weird situation where they think they're a lot better than they actually are. And that's, that's basically my main point about Florentina. Hmm. But one final question. Yeah. You know, I love, I, we'd all love to see Juventus not win the title. They're in ninth. No chance. In row. Zero chance. Zero chance, right? Zero like chance. They have a dysfunctional no. issue. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Nothing. There's no chance. Do you think? Do you think that's a pro it's, I think it's. The Milan clubs? I don't know if Milan – I just – I need to see another five games for them to – I need to see them play Napoli or Juventus or one of these teams before I say this is the one. Um, because say what you want, they, they were in the lead against the Roma three times at home at the San Siro. Milan will be in it, I think, now. I'm, I just don't it's, – it's so difficult at this point because we're so early in the season. But I think Alonso we're going to get – they're going to get their stuff together. They're going to be – they're going to be rolling. Um, I think Napoli, despite their result today, is going to be in it. Um, I think Inter will eventually get their stuff together, but I'm not convinced. Juventus will be in it, but I, I just don't think they have much of a chance. This might be hot take. I think Sassuolo has a – I don't know if they're going to win the league. If they keep it going – They can get top four. Because – okay, so here's, here's something that I, I actually want to say before. Uh, you know how Alonso just came out of nowhere and started being – you know, a great offensive team with some weaknesses in the back. So Swallow, when Alanta deteriorates, and I'm not saying deteriorates, but when they're not that level, so Swallow's going to be right behind them doing exactly. I, I think so Swallow is there. People always say in basketball that um, 
Kobe was Michael Jordan, but just this is not as good. So yeah. I think Sassuolo potentially is is going to be amazing. They're just not as good as Atlanta because if you look at look at the makeup of Sassuolo, they have an outstanding coach who is he's going to be there for a while, but he deserves a big job eventually. They attack so well. They have at this point, I think they have the, they have the, the best attack in the whole league. The first year Atlanta surprised us, they had the best attack in the league, and they're doing the same thing. They have a lot of – Alanta is through their midfield and their creation. Sassuolo has the same creation. And then they have the defense, which is a little questionable on both ends. And if you watch the way Sassuolo play, they can go down 2-0, 3-1, 4-2, whatever it is. And they have total belief that they can get back into a game. Oh, so nice. I, I think – I don't know. It depends what happens with Inter. It depends if Roma can get themselves into it. Because based on what we've seen so far from Roma, it's possible. I think it's not impossible to say that Sassuolo is going to be making the Champions League next season. I don't know if it happens for sure. Um, but but at this point, I would say Napoli probably. I know they lost today. But once they click, I don't know. I think this could be a weird year. Juventus, I just – I just don't think they're good enough because their midfield, it's it's not it's not it's not strong enough. I like McKinney. I like Bentokur. That's about all I like. I, I'm not a big fan. I like Aaron Ramsey. I just don't think he fits this team. I like I like Arthur who came from Barcelona. I don't think he fits. I don't think that he he makes sense with this team. And then Ronaldo and and you got Dybala there and Maratha. Maratha was a strange one. I don't understand why they made that deal in the first place. Um, Okay, maybe there's no chance. I still think there's a small chance. I think finally we're going to get another champion in Italy just because I, I just have a hard time believing that this team is going to all of a sudden, you know, come forward. They didn't in – the, in the big games they played against Roma, they were outplayed against Roma all 90 minutes. Um, they played Napoli. They didn't get to play Napoli. So, really, they've only been tested, you know – one time they lost to they lost to Verona, which is a good team. But every time they've been tested against a good or above average team, they folded. So I don't. I love Pilro. He was one of my favorite players of all time. On my on my Instagram, he's his his free kick is that there's a free kick of his in my picture. So I love the guy. But this is this is a team that's winning anything. Unfortunately, I'm not fortunate. I, I'm not, I'm fine with it. But um, <laughs> there's just too many issues. I think. For sure, but we'll have to wait and see. And I'm glad that, I mean, just as a football fan, that Cristiano Ronaldo is finally back after testing po- yeah. pos- uh, coronavirus negative this week. Yeah. Hopefully, we get to see him at the new camp in December to face like a. Face oh, like I, I hope so. Week. I hope so. We he'll be so yeah. disappointed not to see. Um, but you know, he 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 did good today. Um, I don't think he was great, but that first goal was outstanding. I'll, I'll give him that. And same with Zlatan was another great performance from him. But again. They, they both could have done better. I, I just think people looked at the score and saw, wow. But that first goal was unbelievable, not just because of Pizzo Ronaldo, but the way he was over to, like, go around the goalkeeper and find his space and just stick it. It was, it was nice to see. And you want to see – you want to see Juventus firing at all cylinders. I don't want them to win the league, and I think most no, people don't. Never, never. But at the same time, we want to – we want their – if, if you're going to win the league, you want the other teams to be at their best. Same reason yeah. why – when when Donnarumma got uh, COVID um, positive um, before the Roma game, I was actually bummed. Even though I thought we could get a point, I was bummed because I wanted to beat Milan at their best because it would mean more. Um, so I just think um, that's going to be a great season. It's good to see it's good to see Ronaldo back out there. Zlatan's going to keep doing it. I think these guys are both going to get 30 goals this season, just on penalties alone. <laughs> yeah. I think I think they'll have a. The both of them, I think I can see about 15 to 17 goals each, non-penalty goals, um, which which is fantastic. Um, but yeah, it's it's interesting and it's, it's it's fun to see. And the Champions League games have been fantastic. I, I really, I mean, it's just I'm just been enthused by all of it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. For sure. But there's plenty of action just waiting for us. And thankfully, that international break is over, so no more players can get yeah. sick or get Liverpool injured. Atlanta coming up. I'm so excited. Yeah. <laughs> I can't wait, but we'll have to wait and see in the upcoming weeks to see what the results of those games are. Yeah. It's been a pleasure, Elliot, here for the yeah. Football Apex podcast, and we'll catch you guys next week. All right, see you.